Hey everybody, this is Raymond Woodward, and it's my privilege to teach you this seminar on a very important subject, the subject of holiness. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but Christians everywhere say that they serve a holy God, and their lives are governed by a holy Bible, and they say they want to spend eternity in a holy heaven. Many of them even say that they are filled with the Holy Spirit. And yet it is taboo in most Christian circles today to talk about the word holiness. The very fabric of our culture is unraveling before our eyes right now. Immorality is proudly flaunting its dominance in the classroom and the stateroom and the courtroom and the schoolhouse and especially the media. In my opinion, holiness it has never been more important. And we see Isaiah's prophetic judgment being fulfilled right before our eyes. He said, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. They put darkness in the place of light and light in the place of darkness, bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And his conclusion is this, woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. And never has there been a culture that has fulfilled those words any more than ours. We live in an era when nearly every congregation and denomination is trying to accommodate our culture in some misguided attempt to make Christianity more palatable to sinners. But if we look at the history of the church, both ancient and modern, we can see just how dangerous it is to leave a lifestyle of holiness in an attempt to become more acceptable to the world. German philosopher George Hegel once said, the only thing we learn from history is that we do not learn anything from history. We know from our own history that people and pastors and churches who discard apostolic distinctives are already on the downhill road to disregarding apostolic doctrine. The path is predictable and so are all the arguments. But you see, a holy life is not just a dress code or a list of rules. A holiness lifestyle is not legalism or Phariseeism or bondage. In fact, a holy life is abundantly attractive to anyone who is sick and tired of their sin and sincerely hungry for God. So if I could give you a little exhortation here at the beginning, please save your time and energy for the real battle. Stop worrying about winning debates with people who have walked away from truth and start working to disciple people who are walking toward truth. What we don't need is to create a little apostolic subculture of criticism where we waste every second sermon bashing everybody else. What we do need to do is to teach our people to live holy lives. And so my question for us today is, how do we best teach holiness within the local church? Let me offer you a few ideas that may be of help to you. Number one, holiness is not just about practices, it's about principles. Now my elders, uh, precious men and women of God, they taught me what to do without always teaching me why we did it. And they lived in a generation where they could actually do that. People would obey out of respect. But that tendency created a vacuum that was later taken advantage of by other leaders with agendas. I'm constantly having conversations around this subject and I say to my elders on behalf of younger men, just because they ask why we do something doesn't indicate rebellion. Why is just a question. And it's actually a good question. But I also say to younger men on behalf of my elders, just because the elders didn't always explain why we did something doesn't mean they were wrong about what they taught us. In this generation, our generation, we do have to explain principles, not just demand practices. We have to teach them why and not just tell them what. Let's look at a couple of scriptures. First Peter chapter one, verse 15, but as God, which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. A 400 year old King James word that we would equivalent, uh, make equivalent to lifestyle today. So be ye holy in all manner of your lifestyle because it is written. God says, be ye holy for I am holy. So 
Uh, one principle we need to explain to people that we're discipling is that a lifestyle of holiness is God's expectation for all of his people. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14, the Bible says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Without living a lifestyle of holiness, we can't go to God's holy heaven. And next, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, Paul talks to us and he's praying for the Thessalonians and he says, I'm praying that the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, fully, completely, W-H-O-L-L-Y. I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who, that calleth you who also will do it. We learn from Paul that a lifestyle of holiness affects every area of our lives, not just our dress code, but also not just our heart. It affects spirit and soul and body. And finally, 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter said, but you are a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people. Why would God make us peculiar, a, a rarity, an oddity in the world? Here's why. That ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What gives God the right to make us so different? Well, here it is, which in time past you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. In time past, you had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. If God has done all of that for us, and he expects us to live a lifestyle of holiness, I would say we do it out of gratitude, not of obligation. We learn from Peter that a lifestyle of holiness is supposed to make us stand out in an ungodly world. You have three kinds of holiness teachers in your life. First of all, you have the Bible, God's word, and it teaches us Bible standards. And because we have no wiggle room when God says thou shalt not, or God says that's an abomination to me, these are precepts of God's word that we begin teaching immediately to new converts and new believers. But the Bible doesn't talk about every contemporary issue that we face today. Some of these things did not exist in Bible times. Some of them have modified greatly. There was no internet in Bible times. There was no online temptation, for example. That's why we have our second holiness teacher, our spiritual leadership. And they teach us what we would call church standards. Because these are not direct commands of scripture, but they are principles of scripture. We implement them perhaps more gradually. And sometimes there are differences from church to church, pastor to pastor, culture to culture. Uh, church standards taught by our spiritual leadership. And we are responsible to submit to our spiritual leadership. Paul said, this speak I, not the Lord. He said, I speak this by permission, not of commandment. He still expected God's people to obey and submit because he was their spiritual leadership. And finally, your third holiness teacher is the Holy Spirit. And it resides inside of you. So it teaches you what we might call personal standards. These are promptings, individual promptings given to you by the Holy Ghost. And they are implemented, of course, personally in your own life. I would offer this to you that your personal standards should be the highest standards in your life because the Holy Spirit knows you uh, better than your pastor, better than uh, your, your spouse, better than your friends, better than anyone else. And so your three holiness teachers, the Bible, your spiritual leadership, and the Holy Spirit in you should always agree. If they're not agreeing, something is out of line in your life. Holiness standards are the guardrails in our lives. Guardrails are not located in the most dangerous place, but they're located in a place of safety. They keep us from moving into dangerous areas. Areas. So, so holiness standards are our margin for error. The great Hebrew writer Ahad Ha'am said it this way. More than Israel kept the Sabbath, the Sabbath kept Israel. I would offer to you that all the time apostolic people think we have been keeping holiness standards. Could I suggest that 
in light of where the world is today and where culture is today, perhaps all this time, holiness standards have been keeping us. In this generation, we need to not only say what we do, we need to explain why. We need to not just demand practices, but we need to teach principles. Secondly, as we're discipling people, we need to remember that it is not about perfection, this holiness lifestyle. It is actually more about progress. Holiness is one of the most ancient concepts in the Bible. The Hebrew word kodesh in the Old Testament, the Greek word hagios in the New Testament, they both carry the same meaning, withdrawal, separate, apart, different. In both testaments, sanctification is a synonym for holiness. So the Bible teaches that our sanctification or being set apart in our lifestyle, it is the will of God for every Christian. Paul said that uh, very specifically in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 3, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. And then he goes on to give a specific example in the case of fornication or sexual sin. You see, not everybody who attends a church is actually in the church. And while we welcome and we love everyone who attends, mere attendance at one of our churches is not our goal. Salvation of that soul, that individual, is our goal. But it goes even further than that because the new birth is just the beginning. Real Christianity is not just the decision of a moment, it is the dedication of a life. One of my esteemed teachers in Bible college, Reverend Allison Post, he used to teach us this phrase, salvation is the most elastic word in the Bible. And Brother Post would say, I was saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. He would talk about three processes that we go through in living for God. I was justified in the past. I experienced the new birth and I was saved from sin's penalty. But in the present every day that I live, I am still being saved. I am being sanctified. I enter into a new process and sanctification means I'm being saved from the power of sin over me every day. The longer I live for God, the less sin should have a hold or control over me. And finally, one day I will be saved. I will be taken from the very presence of sin when I am glorified. What a great hope the church has. So I was saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. I was justified, I am being sanctified, and I will be glorified. I was saved from sin's penalty when I was born again. I am being saved from sin's power every day that I walk in the spirit, and I will be saved out of sin's presence at the day of the rapture. It's beautiful, but here's my point. Christians, every Christian that's living and breathing lives in this middle area of salvation. We are right now in the process of growing in God. That's called sanctification and sanctification takes a lifetime. Remember that sanctification in both testaments is a synonym for holiness. So think what that means. Holiness is the point of the Christian life. It's not an add-on, it's not extra credit for some super spiritual individuals. It's for everyone and it's so important. It is the point of the Christian life. Now people say today, God loves you just the way you are. Well, that's true, but it's incomplete. God loves you just the way you are, but he loves you far too much to leave you that way. Sanctification is like a lifelong renovation project and it conforms you into the image of Christ. In the New Testament, image is ikone, the likeness, the resemblance, the representation of Jesus Christ. It's kind of like the icons on your smartphone, ikone, icon. Uh, you see the mail icon and you know that if you click that, you're going to be able to look at your email. Uh, you don't press the 
email icon if you want to look at Facebook or if you want to look at your text messages. What is inside that little piece of software is indicated by the icon that you see that is outside. And that is exactly how we are made into the image of Jesus Christ. What you see on the outside of our lives should reflect what is going on on the inside. As you grow, you begin to think and talk and act and react like Jesus would. This is exactly what Paul was talking about in scriptures like Romans 8 and 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image, the icone of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And so the battle for holiness or sanctification, it is won or lost in the mind because it is our mind or our soul, the individual part of us that must be transformed on a daily basis. On one side is our redeemed spirit. It directs us to do good. But on the other side is our unredeemed body and it tempts us through its five senses to do evil. But as we win the battle of the mind, And as we submit to the leading of the Holy Spirit, there will be more and more external evidence of sanctification in our lives that other people can see. And again, I refer to Paul and his wonderful book of Romans, this time chapter 12. I beseech you, I beg you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So you present your bodies a living sacrifice, the outside part of you that other people can see and interact with, but it's because you've won the battle in your mind, the renewing of your mind, that you were able to grow in sanctification. The third principle I'd like to bring you today is this one. Holiness is not just about the internal, it is about the external. There are a lot of religious people in Christianity today, and they love the phrase saved by grace, but they use it as though grace was an excuse for continuing to live like the world. But grace is not an excuse, brothers and sisters. Grace is an enabling. Grace is God's power to lift you up and give you the ability to live a holy life. Ephesians chapter 2 Paul says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And people love to quote this part, not of works, lest any man should boast. So there, Raymond, not of works. Do you see that? What do you say about that? What I say and what I've said for 40 years is this, read the next verse. Because the next verse says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So good works don't save me. I am not saved by works. But once I am saved, the whole point of being saved is God brought me into his body, into his family, and I am to live unto good works. In fact, he has before ordained that I should walk in these things. The Apostle James in chapter 2, he said, Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. James tells us, a man may say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, James says. But I choose to show you my faith by my works. You believe that there's one God? Well, that's good. You're doing good. You're doing well. The devils also believe and they tremble. But will you know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? And this is why Jesus said things like this in Matthew 5. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your, what? Your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. I've had people protest, but isn't internal holiness more important than external holiness? Well, the short answer to that question is yes. Just like your internal organs, your heart and your lungs, are more important than your external organs, like your eyes and your ears. However, in a normal, healthy body, you want to have both internal and external. 
It's a fatal error to preach external standards without preaching internal standards. But on the other hand, to think that we can be holy on the inside while remaining unaffected on the outside, well, that's an equally fatal error. The real issue for Christians, for believers, is how your internal holiness affects your external lifestyle. Now, this next point is very, very important. Holiness is not about perception. It is about people. You see, because sanctification is about growing in the Lord, it's very important to remember that most issues of holiness are not salvation issues. Rather, they are maturity issues. And this is why we give new believers lots and lots of time to grow. This is why we love everybody in our churches, regardless of their level of spiritual maturity. If we love them before they even get saved, surely we can love them before they get fully sanctified. If we loved them when they were a drug addict or an alcoholic, if we loved them and they came out of some kind of bondage or perversion into the church and we loved them enough to witness to them, surely now that they're part of the family, we can love them while we give them some time to grow and to be sanctified and to develop in holiness. Now, as I said, I've been in ministry for about four decades and here's what I've discovered. New believers are usually not the problem in holiness areas. The only time there's ever a problem with sanctification in the local church is usually when somebody who has been around for a long time and who does understand God's commandments, they suddenly decide, you know what, I'm not going to submit to that. Um, since the church is so patient with all these new believers and all these baby Christians, I think I found a loophole that I can use to avoid God's commandments, God's rules, God's laws. I'll just be a baby Christian all my life and then I can get away with anything. There's only one problem with that idea. Although most issues of holiness are maturity issues, we're not saved by what we wear or what we do. They're maturity issues. They're not salvation issues in and of themselves. However, if we consistently reject God's commands and we continually resist his will for our sanctification, it is our willful disobedience that becomes a salvation issue. Disobedience is always a salvation issue. It's always sin. Sin's always going to separate us from God. It is God's will that we grow. James, the apostle, said very sternly in chapter 4, Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. God's family is not a dysfunctional family. In your family, your physical family, there are members who are mature, those who are immature. There are those who are healthy, those who are sick. Those who are doing well, those who are struggling. And yet you love them all the same because they're your family. God's family is not a dysfunctional family. He loves every member of his family. And our churches need to learn and practice loving every member of the local family of God. However, it would be a tragedy if the children that you loved at home in your earthly family didn't grow up. So you do teach them what maturity looks like and acts like. And God loves his children more than you love your children. So he also has some expectations as to how they should live and act as they mature. And this is why, brothers and sisters, mature saints like you are such a blessing to an apostolic local church. Because without even saying a word, these older siblings in God's family, they serve as an example that every young believer can imitate and learn from. 1 Corinthians 11, Paul said, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. 
It is the job description of mature saints to be an example. So we need to ask ourselves individually, how apostolic would my church be in doctrine, in experience, in worship, in giving, in faithfulness, in holiness, in lifestyle, if every new Christian decided to use me for a pattern? That's an important question. Every pastor, including your pastor, has to negotiate this tension that exists between new converts and older members all the time because it never goes away. If you're going to grow a church, there will always be babies in a growing family. Every pastor has to choose the order of these words in the local church. The word believe and the word belong. And here's the question for us to decide as we close today. Are we going to demand that a new convert has to believe everything we believe and fully embrace every holiness standard before we even let them feel like they belong? Or will we let them belong first? With all their faults and failures and frailties, will we let them feel like they belong? Will we even let them get involved in some kind of area, some peripheral area, before they believe everything they need to believe. Every pastor, including your pastor, has to deal with what I call the local detachment of the Pentecostal police. People who take it upon themselves to measure everybody else's holiness, to pull them over in the foyer and write them a ticket and tell them what they're not doing. And often their attitude is, well, bless God, I had to do this, so you have to do this too. If you're going to grow a church, you've got to help your pastor shut down the Pentecostal police. We don't police babies. We love babies. We nurture babies. We protect them and we care for them. Holiness is not about perception. It's about people. Every pastor has to deal with the perception of saints, neighboring churches, fellow ministers, but if we are constantly making decisions about holiness standards based on what other Christians or what other pastors or what other churches, what we will think, that's wrong. Our overriding concern is not our reputation in the fellowship of the United Pentecostal Church International. Our overriding concern is the growth of that person, not the perception of the fellowship. I hope if you ever visit our church, you find lots of inconsistencies because every one of those inconsistencies, they are one of our babies and we are nurturing them and we're trying to help them grow and we are going to protect them and we love them because the church does not exist for the insiders. The church exists for the whosoever will and where those two categories cross, that's where we find growth, and that's where we find a developing lifestyle of holiness. It's not about perfection, it's about progress. And it's not about perception, what other people think. No, it's about the people that we are growing in the Lord, growing into his body, growing into his family. I pray that some of these things have helped you today. And uh, I pray that uh, you would engage with your pastor in your church in helping to be an example of the believers and nurturing other people, young Christians, baby believers to grow in the beautiful ways of holiness. Holiness is not a burden. Holiness is not bondage. Holiness is one of God's great blessings in our lives. Thank you for listening. May God bless you and may God uh, anoint his word to give you great understanding in Jesus' name.